Well, good day, everybody, and thank you for coming back to the next video. Now, as my last video, I promised I was going to go through the second book of Estras and go through all the interesting bits and pieces that are in here. Um, so I want to do that now. And you guys can download this document. It's, um, it's about 30-some pages. So what I've done here is I just pulled the, I think it's the NRSV version of, of Estras and put it into a Word document and I've added other references to scripture to help uh, for comparison purposes. So, okay. So this is a book that was taken out of the, it wasn't the King James Bible originally. It was taken out in the 1800s. I've, I've heard a few things about it. Some say the Pope did it. I also heard um, maybe this isn't really the case, but I did hear that uh, they were trying to save costs on printing. So the in the King James, they took out the entire Apocrypha, Apocrypha, which was many other books. So when you jump into the book, one of the first things you see here is you see a reference to Judah. I spoke about this in a video yesterday. So it says, What shall I do with you, O Jacob? You, Judah. You would not obey me. I will turn to other nations and will give them my name so that they may keep my statutes. So if you read the um, Genesis chapter 48, it actually says that. It says that the, that the name of Jacob is going to be given to the sons of Joseph. And I'm not sure if that's a reference to that or not. But essentially Judah, the Jewish people, of the time this was written. Um, God was saying they were not obeying him. And then he makes a reference here. He says, this is the Lord speaking. He says, I've gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but now what shall I do with you? I will cast you out of my presence. Okay, For I have rejected your festal days and your new moons and your circumcisions of the flesh. So this right here is a direct quote from Jesus. You know, in Luke 19, the day that he rode in on, on a donkey, when he was going to allow himself to be called king, finally, after after his ministry at the end, on what we call Palm Sunday, he was weeping um, as he rode into Jerusalem on the donkey, and he said this. So, you know, he probably knew about this. Okay, then we get to Second Estras chapter 2, and there's this reference to a mother. Just checking something. There's a reference to a mother. And this mother, when you read the context, it seems like the mother is a reference to the Holy Spirit. And we'll get into that in a second. But it says this. This is the only place where there's a reference to the Assyrian. Now, the Assyrian, in ancient times, was the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria and the Assyrians are the nation that was allowed to conquer the northern kingdom of Israel and calls the northern kingdom to be dispersed up in the Western Europe and to become the lost 10 tribes of Israel that Jesus found at the foot of the cross. So it says, Woe to you, Assyrian, who conceal the unrighteous within you. O wicked nation, remember what I did to Sodom and Gomorrah. So when you read the Old Testament unfulfilled prophets, there is a character. There's a, it's like we have a play going on and there's an, a, and there's an, a character named the Assyrian. And the Assyrian is going to, once again, uh, attack Israel, the house of Israel, just like it did before. It's going to do it again. But this time, it's not the literal Assyrians of ancient times. My thought is the Assyrian and the Assyrians are the deep state cabal, the, the deep state guys, the people that that um, really rule the world with the deep underground military bases. They do all the things that we quite can't figure out who pulls these things off. I see these guys sort of connected up with this Babylonian banking system that's doing all this stuff. So it says, Woe to the Assyrian who concealed the unrighteous within you. So this person, whoever this Assyrian is, now some think it might be the Antichrist after he rises up from the dead. But who? So this person is concealing unrighteousness. Then it says, O wicked nation, remember what I did to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now when you read Jubilee 16, Jubilees is a book that's not in our Bible, but there's a lot of references to it. A lot of people think that maybe it should. I take it as a reference book. When you read Jubilee 16, uh, you learn that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed in the fourth month of Tammuz. If you recall, Abraham 
had a visit from God and two angels. And after God left, the two angels went down to Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's when the two angels pulled um, Lot and his uh, wife and two daughters out of there, just as the fire began to fall. So I have always thought that uh, Sodom and Gomorrah sort of represented the, the whole pr Gay Pride Month. And that in the in the month of June, which is Gay Pride Month, that corresponds to Tammuz, that the Lord would begin to exert his judgment in the same way, like it says here, Jubilee 16, verse 6, and in like manner God will execute judgment on the places where they have done accordingly the uncleanliness of the Sodomites, like unto the judgment of Sodom. Okay. All right, so that could be just around the corner if this is the year. And then Ezra, then the, then the Lord says to Ezra, Tell my people that I give them the kingdom, that we the kingdom of Jerusalem, that floating city, which I was going to give to Israel, the remnant of the northern kingdom, the church of today. But of course the church is going to have to go into the wilderness because they're unclean. They need to be refined. That woman from Revelation 12. Moreover, I will take back my take back their glory, and I will give it to these these everlasting habitations that would be the supernatural dwellings you know, in my father's house you know are many mansions many dwelling places if it were not so um, I would have told you Jesus said in John 14 okay so here's this more reference to a mother it says mother embrace your children bring them up with gladness as as does a dove now remember that when the Holy Spirit came down and fell on Jesus when he was baptized the text says that the Holy Spirit fell upon Jesus like a dove. So we see a reference here, like this Holy Spirit has this feminine quality that's being referenced here to some degree. And it says this, And I will raise up the dead from their places and bring them out of their tombs because I recognize my name on them. So at the beginning of the tribulation, when events begin, there is going to be a resurrection of the dead in Christ that are going to rise first. This this sometimes gets missed when we're reading the, the book of Daniel. It says, And at that time Michael shall arise, the great prince who has charge over your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, Jacob's trouble, the tribulation. So when the tribulation begins, this is not the seven years, it's the seals and the trumpet judgments. When the seals and the trumpet judgments begin, It'll be a time that has never been till this nation, till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. They shall escape, is the word in Hebrew. Everyone whose name is found written in that book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. So right when the seals begin, people, formerly dead people, are going to wake up, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. But those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the sky above, and a second group, and those who turn many to righteousness, that's the harvest workers, they will shine like the stars in heaven forever and ever. Okay, so you probably never read it this way before. And I have a document that goes over this. I don't have it handy right now. But this word delivered means shall escape. Remember, Jesus says, pray that you have strength to escape. And there's going to be a resurrection. Now, a lot of folks, in the book of 2 Baruch, it speaks about this. Let's go ahead and look it up right now. It's going to take me a minute to find it. And you guys can go. I'll leave a link for my second Baruch. Right here, it is right here. Okay, this is a this is the second book of Baruch, chapters forty nine to fifty two. The nature of the resurrection body. So Baruch is speaking with the Lord. He says, "I will ask you, O oh, mighty one. Yes, I ask a favor of you." He says, "In what form will the living live in your day? That would be the day of the Lord." And the Lord says, "Baruch, listen to this word. Write it down in the memory of your heart. Everything that you shall learn." He says. For the earth shall surely give back the dead at that time, at the time of tribulation, the time of the seals and trumpets. That's before the seven years. Currently, the, the world receives them in order to preserve them, not making any change in their form. 
but it has but as it has received them so it will give them back and as I have delivered them to it so it will also raise them here's the key verse for at that time remember at that time so at that time I think it's in here somewhere else uh, yeah but at that time this is Daniel 12 your people shall be delivered it's the same type of terminology verse 3 for at that time it will be necessary to show the living that the dead have come back to life again and that the departed have returned so you can see how second Baruch chapter 50 verses 2 to 3 line up to some degree to Daniel 12 Okay? And Daniel 12 has a very confusing verse that the very smart people who have PhDs and study all this stuff, they struggle. There's going to be a resurrection of some to shame and everlasting contempt. What they'll say is they'll say, oh yeah, well, that's referring to the after 1,000 years. There really should be a reference to 1,000 years. Then there'll be, no, that's not what it says. At the time of trouble, tribulation, God is going to allow formerly dead people to be raised from the dead who are both bad and good so Satan can have his day too. See this second Baruch, here we go again, second Baruch provides backup information for Daniel 12 2 to make sense. But since people don't read these apocryphal books they don't they don't know that in, in most cases here. So let's see what this says here. It says then when those who are currently know each other at the present time will at that time recognize each other, it will happen that my judgment will be strong, that's the seals, and those things which have previously been spoken of will come. And after, and it will happen after this, the appointed day has gone by, that appointed day reference, that both the appearance of those who were found guilty, so the bad people that are raised, as well as the glory of those who are righteous, they will be changed. So there's going to be a change. So what's hap what I'm saying here is <laughs> there's going to be a resurrection of formerly dead people. Good people and bad people. Okay, I have a sense that um, Martin Luther King Jr. is going to be raised. He's going to fix this problem we have. You know this problem we have with that we argue about our races all the time and the color of our skin. And then potentially somebody who's bad is going to be real, like somebody like Hitler. I don't know. But then sometime later, at the appointed time, all will be changed. There'll be a change. Now, Paul speaks about a change in 1 Corinthians 15. Yeah. There'll be a change. Okay, For those who are presently acting wickedly will suffer torment at that time. As those will suffer, their appearance will be made worse than it is at present. Furthermore, the glory of those who are presently been made righteous by the law, remember Jesus is the law of the word, who possessed understanding of their life, who planted the root of wisdom in their heart at that time, their splendor will be glorified by transformations and the appearance will be the face, will be changed into a light of their beauty. So basically, those folks who are on the side of good are going to get a transformed angelic type body, which Paul speaks about here, but those who act wickedly are going to get a body that's going to be even worse than it is at present. It's kind of strange. Like Remember those zombies we keep seeing on TV shows? Okay, you guys can download this document. I'll post it up here. Let me go back to this. So there's going to be a resurrection of dead people right in the beginning when the seals are busted loose. Just like it was at the time of Jesus when all those dead people raised up in Matthew 27 and he went about witnessing to others. I will fill your children with joy, says the prophet. Okay, this is the part that pertains to us. Okay, It says, Do not be anxious, for when the day of tribulation and anguish comes, others shall weep and be sorrowful, but you shall rejoice and have abundance. The nation shall envy you, but they will not be able to do anything against you, says the Lord. My power will protect you, such that your children may not see hell. Rejoice, O mother, Mount Zion, for your children, because I will deliver you, says the Lord. This is, this is straight out of Isaiah 66, verses 6 and 7. I did a, a video of this the other day. And this part about, look, look what it says. Do not be anxious for when the day of tribulation comes. Others shall weep and be sorrowful, but you shall rejoice and have abundance. And it says, wait for your shepherd, be Jesus. He will give you everlasting rest because he will come at the end of the age 
when it is close at hand. Be ready for the reward of the kingdom, because perpetual light will shine on you forevermore. Flee, this is the part about the darkness coming to the earth. Flee from the shadow, the darkness event, of this age. So these folks are going to be yanked off the planet and taken to the throne room, and they're going to receive glorious garments and a crown. Right here. I'll, I'll read it real quickly. So those who have departed from the shadow of this age, a darkness event, something's going to get in front of the sun and cause a shadow to occur on the planet. Just like when Jesus died on the cross, the whole earth went dark for three hours. These folks who have departed are going to receive glorious garments. You've heard that before. It says, take again your full number, O Zion. These are the sons of Zion, Isaiah 66, verse 7. And close the list of your people who are clothed in white, who have fulfilled the law of the Lord. The number of your children, doesn't say 144,000, but it's referring to them, whom you desired is now complete. Implore your Lord's authority that your people who have been called from the beginning will be made holy. And then Ezra said, I saw on Mount Zion, this sounds like Revelation 14, a great multitude that I could not number. Maybe this is Revelation 7. They were all praising the Lord with songs. That's it, Revelation 7, 9 through 17. In their midst was a young man, that'd be Jesus, of great stature, taller than all the others, and on his head, and on his head he placed a crown on them. But he was more exalted than they were. And I was spellbound, and I asked the angel, this sounds like Revelation 7, by the way. Who are these, my Lord? He answered and said to me, These are they who have put off mortal clothing and have put on immortal, and they have confessed the name of God. Now they are being crowned, and they will receive palms. Same thing as Revelation 7. I think you guys, it would look something like this. Now when you go to Revelation 7, it says the same thing. Palms. A great multitude standing in front of the throne. Did I turn it? Okay, good. Sorry about that. Right here. Is the word palms in here? Yeah. They have white robes on, with palm branches in their hands, crying out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Okay, The great tribulation is not seven years or three and a half years. The great tribulation is the seals and the trumpet judgments. So these people are yanked out of the seal judgments. If you look at my one document, I, I show this on my timeline. This is why this has been so confusing. People have to take... They assume the Great Tribulation is seven years or three and a half years. And then that forces them to think that this event occurs at the end of the seven years. Then it requires them to say, oh, Revelation is not chronological. It's because this like one errant thought leads to another, and it forces things to be incorrect from that point on. For the most part, Revelation, in my opinion, is chronological. Right now, we're at the end of Revelation 3. See, right now we're at the end of the church age. Revelation 3, these letters, right? And so the very next thing that's going to happen is those who are part of the 144,000 are going to be yanked up into the throne room right here, just like John was. Come up here. I will show you what must take place. And I was in spirit. They leave in spirit, not body. And they're going to go witness what's going on up in <clears throat> the throne room. These folks are going to witness Jesus taking the scroll out of the hand of the one who sits on the throne and they're going to begin to watch him open the seals but that's in the heavenly realm that's in a in, in a time that we can't even imagine how it's going to work so the seals are opened Jesus opens the seals inside a different set of like a different time it's basically eternities when he's doing it anyway I digress but let me go back to the study document so the, the moral of the story here is that Right when the darkness event occurs, the whole world's going to be going to weep and be sorrowful. But there's going to be a group of people that are yanked off the planet that go up to Mount Zion, in the heavenly Mount Zion, I'm sorry, and they're going to receive their palms and their crowns. And then the, Ezra asks, who is this young man? He says, he is the son of God whom they confessed in the world. 
Now, go back. Now, Ezra, I'm sorry. Ezra's told, go back and tell my people how great and how many are the wonders that the Lord God that you've seen. So this is what's going to happen to us. We're going to be up there and we're going to say, we're going to be told, go back down to earth and tell the people these same things. Okay. All right, I'm going to kind of scroll through this. I'm only going to kind of review things that I see here that I've highlighted. He tells them a lot of things. You guys should, should read this, really. Okay, here's the part. Two places in the book of 2 Estras, it speaks about that the Lord's voice is going to be heard. We see the same thing in Isaiah 30. So it's a, it goes like this. It says, basically these events are going to begin, but if the Most High grants that you live, you shall be you shall see it thrown into confusion after the third period. He's basically saying that this these cataclysmic tribulation type Jacob's trouble events are going to begin after the third period. Now we could assume that there are three 2,000 year periods which equals 6,000 years and after the third period is essentially where we are right now. All of a sudden, suddenly, it would, the sun will begin to shine at night. The moon will shine during the day. Blood will drip from wood and stone will utter its voice and the people shall be troubled and the stars shall fall. That appears to be the sixth seal. This is where it gets very weird. <laughs> okay, you got to follow me on this one, guys. I know we had this crazy election, and I'm not making any statements about Trump. But but just if I were to delete this right here, let's just, let me just delete this right here. It says this, and one shall reign whom those who inhabit the earth do not expect. And the birds shall fly away together. The dead, shall cat, the dead Sea shall cast up its fish, and one whom many do not know shall make his voice heard by night, and all shall hear his voice. Well, I know that this voice is the voice of Jesus, because this prophecy is describing an event where the entire earth is going to hear the voice of Jesus. And we see the same thing in Isaiah 30. So when we see something here in the second book of Estras that perfectly lines up with scripture from the existing 66 books of canon then we can look at the other things that it said and we can we can take note of it and say hmm i wonder if that's going to happen now this one who shall reign i, I you know you keep hearing talks about trump coming back i'm not one of those folks who think that's going to happen but i look at this scripture and i thought what does this mean and one shall reign whom those who inhabit the earth are not expecting and the birds, you know, in Luke 17, it says, um, one will be taken and one will be left. And then the disciples say, where, Lord? And he says, this is Luke 17, verse 34. And Jesus says, where the eagles gather, no, I'm sorry, where the body of Christ um, gathers, the eagles will be there, or something to that effect. Well, these eagles are going to fly away. That's speak for flying away off the planet. Remember in uh, Exodus, I think it says, the Lord says, I took you out of Egypt as wings on eagles or something to that effect. This eagle flying thing is metaphor for being taken off the planet like um, Elijah was in that fiery chariot. So I don't know who this could be. I threw Trump's name in there, but I, I was just guessing. Maybe it's the Assyrian reigns who no one's expecting. And it's going to be those who inhabit the earth. So maybe it's an earthly reign. But regardless, Jesus is going to make his voice heard. And we see the same thing. I reviewed this the other day. So that the, the part from Isaiah 30 goes like this. It says, You shall have a song as in the night when a holy feast is kept, and gladness of heart is when one sets out to the sound of the flute to go to the mountain of the Lord. I think that's the new city, Jerusalem. This is a removal of of the first fruits to some degree or something to that effect as the lord will cause his majestic voice to be heard and the descending blow of his arm the assyrians okay isaiah 30 is a future prophecy never fulfilled in the past the assyrians who i think are the deep state satanic cia cabal operatives will be terror stricken at the voice of the lord and when he strikes with his rod that tribe remember that rod is a tribe 
I say it's the mighty warriors of Ephraim, 144,000. And every stroke of the appointed staff, the Luke 10 appointed harvesters, that the Lord lays on them, the Assyrians, will be the sound of tambourines and lyres. Battling with his brandished arm, he, Jesus, will fight with them. For a burning place has long been prepared. Indeed, for the Assyrian king is made ready. Its pyre made deep, the pile of combustible material, made deep and wide with fire and wood in abundance. And the breath of the Lord, like a stream of sulfur, will kindle it. Just like it says in Second Thessalonians 2, verse 8 where the man of lawlessness will be killed with the breath of Jesus. Same thing, same event. Matthew 13, 30, same thing. Gather the weeds first and bind them into bundles, but gather the wheat into my barn. This is where it gets a little wild and crazy. I don't know what to make of this, guys. You guys can take this to the Lord. There shall be chaos in many places. Fire shall often break out. Wild animals shall roam beyond their haunts. And menstruous women shall bring forth monsters. Is this some kind of type of reference to a, a, a Nephilim? You know, Jesus said it will be as it was in the days of Noah when the fallen angels were impregnating women and they were, they were delivering monsters, these Nephilim. Is that what that means? Wisdom shall withdraw from its chamber. That's just... That's a wild one, guys. Let me just do that voice one time. Let me go right to the other voice reference. Because the voice of the Lord is heard here. And now I'm down to chapter 13. Here it is again. This is really incredible when you read this here. This is uh, verse 33. Chapter 13 of 2nd Estras. Let me just jump to this. Then, then when all the nations hear his voice, all the nations shall leave their own lands and the warfare they that they have against one another. So they're getting ready to go to war against each other. And an innumerable multitude shall be gathered together, as you saw, wishing to come and conquer him. That would be Jesus. Now this is the interpretation of a vision that was given to Ezra. This is the interpretation part. I'm not going to go back and look at the other part, but it's the same thing. But he, but Jesus, he shall stand on the top of Mount Zion, that floating city above the earth, and Zion shall become and be made visible, manifest to all people prepared and built as you saw the mountain carved, carved out without hands. Then he, my son, will reprove, remember that, you know, um, that Christmas song, he will make the nations prove joy to the world. Then he, my son, will reprove the assembled nations of their ungodliness. This is symbolized by the storm. I say Jesus will be draining the swamp this time, and he'll do it. And will reproach them to their face with their evil thoughts and the torments with which they are to be tortured. And will destroy them without effort by means of the law, which is symbolized by the fire. And as for the people that were gathered to him, this multitude that was peaceable. See, there was a peaceable group. There was Christians, essentially. These are the ten tribes. See, Ezra even knows this. I showed this in the video. These, the, the peaceable group are the Christians who are the ten tribes that were taken away from their own land into exile under King Hosea, who the king of the Assyrians took captive in 720. 2 BC, I added that part. Basically, what he's saying, there's a peaceable multitude that's going to go and follow Jesus. Who are the lost ten tribes? Who are the Christians of today? He took them across a river into another land. He basically goes through the, the history of how the ten tribes were lost and where they were taken to. Western Europe, you guys can read this. Then they, the lost ten tribes, lived there until the end of days. And now... When they are about to come again, the Most High will stop the channels of the river again so that they may cross over. Therefore, you saw the multitude gathered together in peace. But those who are left... So, so there's a he's taken the, the green text of the Christians. He's going to leave behind the people who live within his holy bounties, the Jews. But those who are left, left behind, 
of your people, the Jews, who are found within my holy borders, that would be the land of Israel in the Middle East, they shall be saved. Therefore, when he destroys the multitude of nations that are gathered together, he will defend the people who remain. And then he, Jesus, will show them many wonders. I think that's Zechariah 12. See, th this gives a more clear understanding of how this is all going to play out. That's why I would download this and read this for yourself, guys. It's pretty incredible. Okay. Um, let me go towards the end here. Uh, this is the part I've read before. This is the it says, further denunciations prepare for the end of days. This is seal one. This is sort of a brief overview from top to bottom um, given to Ezra. It says, woe to you, Babylon and Asia. Woe to you, Egypt and Syria. Bind sackcloth and cloth and goat's hair. Whenever the Bible says to bind on sackcloth, the little ones are always mentioned later and they're always taken. Wail for your children and lament for them because the Lord took them like, he, like his promise was. For your destruction is at hand. A fire has been sent upon you. And who was there to quench it? Calamities have been sent out upon you. These are the seals. And who was there to drive them away? Can one drive away a hungry lion? That would be Jesus, the lion in the thicket. We learned about that in Hosea 5.14. I, like a lion, will go to Ephraim and steal away. You know the whole thing. Jeremiah 50, verse 45. I, a lion in the thicket, will come. You know that whole thing. And drag away the little ones. Can one drive off a hungry lion in the forest or quench a fire, that stubble that once has started to burn? Can one turn back the arrow, that's the harvest workers he's going to shoot out, shot by a strong archer? That strong archer is Jesus, right? He's carrying the bow. The Lord God sends calamities, and who will drive them away? Fire will go forth from his wrath, and who can quench it? He will flash lightning. That's exactly what it says in Habakkuk 3 when he's riding the horse there. And who was not and who will and who will not be afraid? Okay. He will thunder and who will not be terrified? The Lord will threaten. So when you read all this, you know, talks about an archer, a lion, flash lightning. He, right hand he, for his right hand bends the bow, is strong, and his arrows that he shoots are sharp. When they are shot to the ends of the world, not one will miss. Just as an arrow shot by a mighty archer does not return, so the calamities that are set forth on the earth shall return. Alas for me, alas for me, who will deliver me from these days? This is seal one. We got lightning, we got arrows, we got a bow, we got an archer. What does this sound like to you? Well, let's go to Habakkuk 3. I've looked at this many times. Here it is. Habakkuk 3 is the Lord coming. He's, God came from Timan, the Holy One, that's Jesus, from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens. The earth was full of his praise. Remember that full of praise thing on Isaiah 24 when the earth is utterly broken and all of a sudden songs of praise break out all over the entire world when all hell's breaking loose? His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hands. Before him, pestilence and plague Followed at his heels. What, that's the fourth seal. He stood and measured the earth. The eternal mountains scattered. Okay. He rode on horses on your chariot of salvation. You stripped the sheep from your bow, calling for many arrows. It's all the same stuff. What was the word in here we were looking for? He will flash lightning. He had lightning. Is that in Habakkuk 3 or is that in... Yeah, his brightness was shown like the light. Th th this event right here, these lighten up the sky events, it's all the same event. Luke 17. These are the days of the Son of Man. The days are coming when one will desire... This is Jesus speaking. The days are coming when one will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man. But you will not see it, he says. For as lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. So there are these days that Jesus refers to for the Son of Man where he's going to light up the sky. And so if you go back to Isaiah 30, 
Okay, well, what happens later? What happens later is there's a reference to Noah and eating and drinking and Lot and all that stuff. And there's a reference to remember Lot's wife. Well, the, the whole issue with Lot's wife was on the month of Tammuz. So this is another clue saying that this, this event is going to be in the month of Tammuz. I tell you at that night, two will be in bed, one will be taken, one will be left. There'll be two grinding at the mill, one will be taken, one will be left. Where, Lord? Where? He says, this is a terrible translation. Where the court, where the body of believers is, the eagles gather. So what about these days of the Son of Man that he's going to light up the sky from one side to the other? Well, we find the days of the Son of Man here. Okay, right here. This is we're back to Isaiah 30 again. Aaron had a dream about Isaiah 30. You know, for a people shall dwell in the heavenly Mount Zion and weep no more. That would be the people that are being taken early, that hear the song in the night and go up to the mountain with the flute and all that stuff going on. Moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun. So the moon is going to be as bright as the sun. That's going to be pretty darn bright, right? And then the light of the sun will be sevenfold, seven times, as the light of seven days, in the day when the Lord binds up his brokenness of his people. So the day that the Lord's going to heal all his people, infill them with the Holy Spirit, send them out to work, start to begin the work, the harvest, he's going to light up the sky for seven days with the sun seven times brighter than it is now. Those seven days, in my opinion, are the days of the Son of Man. Behold, the Lord comes. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar, burning with anger, thick rising smoke. This is the late. See, no, no one would know anything about this unless you search for these terms elsewhere in the Bible. I've never seen anybody bring this up. And see, Luke 17, th th there's no mention of war. See, Luke 17 is an early departure, a pre-tribulation rapture for a very small group of people. I think it's the wise virgins. That's why it says one will be taken and one will be left. Five wise, five foolish. The five wise taken, the five left. When Jesus lights up the sky, there's no mention of war, rumors of war, none of that. This is an early event. I don't... I've heard I've even heard people try to say that that when the people are taken they're taken to a pile of dead bodies. See, this is what happens when you don't look into the original Greek and you get misled. I was sat in church one day and somebody was trying to explain to me from some book that some woman wrote that said that if you were taken it's like because of the in the days of Noah the people that were swept away died in the flood. Yeah, they did. And and they somehow equated that to this and for years I thought, oh, these people get taken away um, and they die. The people who were taken die is what I learned in church. And then when I started looking at this years ago, I'm thinking, well, they're taken where the body of believers is. L let's look up Luke 17, verse 37. L let's see what the real language says and not rely on people who write books mind-numbing to me for you guys. I'm sorry. I am just I remember hearing people telling me that. Here, right here. Here we are. Here's the, here's the Greek. And answering, they said to him, Lord, where? And he said, where the soma, where the body is, Strong's 4983 Greek, the body of the church, the physical body, or used figuratively as the mystical body of Christ. So the people who are taken are taken to a gathering of the body of Christ. And they're going to go where the eagles gather. And the symbolism of the eagles gathering is these escape chariots to depart from the planet. And it all goes back to Luke 17. I know I'm moving quickly here, guys. And then when you go back to Isaiah 30... It, it tells you where they're going to go. The prophet says where they are. Okay? 
Therefore the Lord wants to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is the God of justice. Blessed are those who wait on him. Remember, strength will rise as you wait upon the Lord, that song. For a people shall dwell in the heavenly Mount Zion. You shall weep no more. And this is when Jesus shows his face to you. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teacher will not hide that Rabini, remember the what's her name, the Mary Magdalene, when she saw Jesus on the day he rose from the dead, she referred to him as a rabbi or a rabbi, a teacher. Yet your teacher will not hide himself anymore, but your eyes will see your teacher. Let, let me just translate that. Yet your eyes will see Jesus face to face, and your ears will hear Jesus speak to you, saying, "This is the way. Walk in it. Walk through this supernatural portal." And go somewhere else. This is much better than this place. And when you turn to the right or when you turn to the left, you guys can read it. But you can see what's going on here. When all this goes down, it's during the time of the days of the Son of Man. And you shall have a song in the night when a holy feast, I'm hoping that holy feast is the true Pentecost, is kept. And one sets out to the sound of the flute to go to the mountain of the Lord. Remember the mountain of the Lord? That's the heavenly Mount Zion mountain. We looked at that the other day. When you go to Revelation 21, that's what it is. It's not the dirt hill in earthly Jerusalem. And everybody will hear the majestic voice, the descending blow. I read this before. I'm repeating myself, guys. But that's how we can figure out what's going on here. And it all starts with the little ones being taken and Jesus at seal number one. And going back and look at all the other verses, chapters and verses that speak with a guy riding a horse with a bow. Okay, then it goes into the beginning of sorrow. See, what happens is when Jesus mentions all this in Matthew 24, he begins with the beginning of sorrows. It literally says, he says the beginning of, these are the beginning of pang, sorrows. He skips this part. He doesn't tell the Jews that. And maybe that's why in Matthew it's written to the Jews. But we have this here to read. We, we can read this ourselves and know that this is, pertains to us. And yes, this could certainly pertain to the Jews, and it will, if they're not believers. Okay, then it makes a reference to everybody running to the cleft of the rocks. That's the sixth seal. We all we all know that. Okay, guys, I think I have gone through this long enough. I just download this and read this yourself. It's thirty some pages. It's a lot of incredible information in here. With that, guys, I'll let you go. Have a great day, and God bless you.